Welcome again to the IDS Hour. I'm your host, Paul Honeycutt, with an itch over my nose, and I joined as always by Jeff Volker. Jeff, we're starting a new sort of series today, uh, and it's uh, it's something that I'm seeing, and I know you are as well, on Facebook and other social media, and that's there's a, a new, I don't know what we would call it exactly, but a, a new group, let's just say, that go by the, the title Progressive Covenantalism. These are guys that are coming out of covenant theology, moving, I think, in a good direction towards new covenant theology, but there are a number of, I think, key areas where we would necessarily need to disagree with them and rather than take them to task we won't ever want to do that uh, or even even look you know look down on them in any sense I thought we'd just look at the some of the areas that we have different opinions some of them we've already covered so we'll probably gloss over those but just talk about some of the key points that progressive covenantalism is holding to where true new covenant theology our views would say no that's not actually Biblical, we would go in a different direction. And so, of course, our view is true. Uh, we are 100%. Uh, if we that. had white hats, we would wear them. <laughs> exactly. But anyway, so this is, uh, in fact, just is just uh, one of our good friends. We don't, he'll go nameless, but a good friend of ours, a guy who, who we greatly respect and like. Uh, he refers to progressive covenantalism as the halfway house. And we laugh because, because in a sense, it's true. These guys are coming out of, many of them, uh, a lot of these guys that started kind of on, on ca- campuses, uh, seminaries, etc., and they're moving in a slowly but steady direction towards New Covenant theology and away from Covenant theology, but there's certain aspects to Covenant theology they just can't seem to let go of. Mm. And that's where we'll differ. So let me just kind of start, run down this little bit of a list, which is in one of the books that we've, we've read about them, and let you sort of uh, deal with them. One we've already talked about in our series on Covenants, but that they do not, they, they believe and hold to a creation covenant. Yeah, that is a uh, a bit of a sticking point, because uh, is there a covenant in the garden? Right. And we would say no, um, and we've we've discussed this in other places. But let's just sort of talk about, at least from my point of view, how we handle scripture. If you go to Genesis chapter two, and you have God talking with Adam in the garden. You, it's in verse in Genesis 2 beginning of verse 15 it says the Lord God took the man put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it and the Lord God commanded the man you are free to eat from any tree in the garden but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat from it you will certainly die now nothing else is said and then the Lord provides him Eve a helper and then um that is basically it. That is basically it. And so I think what we want to do is just honestly look at this and say, are, is there any components of a covenant? Now, of course, uh, my, de- my definition of a covenant is rather basic. It's, it's an arrangement between God and man. It's an, I mean, or, or some sort of an, it's some sort of an arrangement. The context always determines what type of an arrangement it is. But here, all you have is God giving Adam one law. Don't eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do that, you're going to die. Okay, that's it. So you have the giving, or if nothing else we would say, the first giving of law. Mm -hmm. That's what you would have here. uh, The first giving of a law. But there is no, there is no sort of, Arrangement whereby Adam has to accept this. This is just imposed by God. Uh, there is no uh, statement that if you don't eat mm. the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you, you will get this positive thing. There's no mention of that. So what we have when we interact with covenant theology is there is this scenario that they have thought through and from their line of thinking and that they say, well... If Adam had just held out and not eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would have been confirmed in righteousness. And then that's what of, okay, well, that sounds good, but there's no place in Scripture that addresses Genesis 2 here with Adam that talks about that. But he was already righteous. 
See, that's the point. <laughs> well, well, when you talk about salvation, if you break it down to its b- most basic mm-hmm. part, is that you are in relationship with God. Right. And Adam was created, and Eve were created in relationship with God. So in the ultimate sense of the term, they were saved, in the ultimate sense, but they were, of course there was no sin, so saved doesn't really mean, is mm-hmm. meaningless. Mm-hmm. But they had a relationship with God. They just had the, the opportunity to lose it. Right. Well, now we, as believers, through the death of Jesus on the cross, when we're granted the gift of faith, we now come into a relationship with God. Ah. And that's what salvation is. We talk about repentance and faith and all of that and the work of Christ on the cross, but the end result of all of that is you now have a relationship with God. Well, that's what Adam and Eve had in the garden. Right. So there was... Would a, it be wrong to say, that just triggered a thought, they had a relationship with God. Okay, they didn't have to do anything to have that. That was already no. that was established in the beginning. Okay, they were free to sin or not sin at that point. Yes. Correct? They could have, uh, we know it's not in part, obviously, God's plan ultimately, but they could have, in, in a sense, refused Satan's offer and and they'd still be in the garden. And as they say, the rest would be different history. Uh, whereas after the sin, after the fall, right. none of us have free will because ultimately we are we are, are are slaves to sin because of Adam's sin. Yeah, there's two different things to keep in mind. Yeah. But in the garden, Adam and Eve did not have a bad heart, which made them a slave to sin. Right. They did not have that. But God sovereignly determined that they there would be this sin in the garden. Mm-hmm. Okay, After they get kicked out of the garden, after they have sinned, as a result of Adam's sin, now everyone has a bad heart. Mm-hmm. So they are a slave to sin. It's impossible for the unbelievers to do anything that God calls good or, or to believe on the gospel message. That's true. So well, when you say free will, mm-hmm. you have to be careful because even in the garden... Yes, it is true that they were not, uh, did not have this bad heart, right. which guaranteed that they would not, quote, believe. But God was still absolutely sovereign. So they, they weren't free in that sense. They, they were free in the sense they didn't have a bad heart. Mm-hmm. After the fall, man is not free in any sense, mm-hmm. but God is, and God is still sovereign. Right. So y- you do have to fine-tune it a little sure, bit. Sure, sure. Um, okay. Uh, okay, well, we should sure. bring up Please, yeah. that, you know, in, in Romans 5, 12 through 21, uh, there is more to the Adam, cry, the Adam, you know, what happened to Adam in the garden. What did that mean? And there is more to it. So we clearly admit mm-hmm. that. But Romans 5, 12 through 21 is very simple. Adam represented everybody, and everybody whom he represented is blamed for his sin. Mm-hmm. Well, that's straightforward. Everybody, you know, we buy that Romans 5. I don't, that's very straightforward. M- my point is that in no other sense does the New Testament say Adam represented us. Mm-hmm. In no other sense. And so when we talk about is there a covenant in the garden, it's always Adam represents us in a sense other than that we're blamed for his sin. Mm-hmm. And my point is, no. No, that's, uh, there's no verse that says that. That's a theological theory, but it's, it's not derived from Scripture. There is no Scripture. So that's why we really do say when you examine it on its face value, there is no covenant in the garden. The second point that we would, and we, we have dealt with this many times on, on, on this show and, and other places, but I still have to bring it up, and that is they would hold the progressive covenantal guys mm-hmm to the idea of Christ's active obedience and it being imputed to us. Oh. Um, that is something we would... Obviously. Oh, yeah. I I do get beat up on this quite <laughs> regularly. <laughs> you're, the, you're, you're, the, you're the bruised and battered poster child. Oh, right? this was... Um, and, and we were reluctantly drawn in, into this controversy many years ago because um, I, I did hold to that the law-keeping of Jesus had to be imputed or placed into our account mm-hmm. to be saved. Mm-hmm. And I, I did. Uh, but then uh, I was challenged on that, and by re-examining the evidence, I came up on the other side. The bottom line, the most basic point 
is how do we become righteous? Mm -hmm. How do we become righteous? So if you if you turn to the book of Romans, chapter three, we're going to look at a passage in three and four. You you Romans chapter three, twenty one to thirty one. Now everybody agrees as far as dividing up the book of Romans that this is where uh, the righteousness of God is explained and. Verse 21 says this, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And we talk in terms of the righteousness is the perfection that we must share with God if we are going to be accepted. So remember the most basic question when we talk about evangelism is how can a holy God accept sinful men? And the answer is he cannot unless everything God has against us has been satisfied. His justice has been satisfied. And of course, so we, so we have to get the righteousness of God, this perfection. And, and the answer is in 321 to 31 is we get it through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus, where it says in verse 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. This is how you get it. And lest we miss the point in 3, you go to chapter 4 and you go to verse 6, because all of chapter 4 is describing that the way we get this righteousness, you know, is, well, 3 says it's the cross. 4 says we get that by faith in the work of Christ on the cross. So chapter 4 is all about faith. But go down to verse 6. It talks about David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. When he says, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. That is, This righteousness that is credited to us apart from works is the forgiveness of sins, which is the work of Christ on the cross. So now you have rather clear definition of how do we get the righteousness of God. We get it by having our sins forgiven. Jesus was righteous because he obeyed perfectly. And he had to obey perfectly to be qualified to be our substitute on the cross. We got that. But the the last place we go... Is is Romans five eighteen and nineteen, where where it says talking about Adam Christ relationship. Consequently, verse eighteen says, just as one trespass, that's Adam's sin, resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. That is, all those whom Adam represented, they are condemned by his one sin. We're all blamed for his one sin. Then all those for whom Jesus represented, they get eternal life through his one act of righteousness, which is the cross. And verse 19 then says the same thing in different words. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners. Remember, we're only concerned for the disobedience of the one sin. Mm -hmm. All the rest of Adam's disobedience, we don't care about. It doesn't apply to us. So also, through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. We're only looking about, looking at the obedience of Jesus to the one act of righteousness on the cross. The rest of his life doesn't save us. But it's his work on the cross that saves us, which is why in the Lord's Supper, we are commemorating the cross, not his law-keeping, the mm-hmm. cross. So these are the passages, and we... This discussion, I have become, I was reluctantly pulled into this discussion some years ago, and I've been reluctant for a number of years to make an issue of this, but I'm sort of changing my Mm -hmm. uh, approach. I just think this is now very important to understand some basic truths of the faith. How do we become righteous? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, the, this is the issue of salvation. How do I become righteous? If I don't become righteous, God cannot accept me. And, and it defines it in, Rome, in Romans chapter 4, 
I have to get forgiveness of sins. And that's just an, that, that is just built on the explanation of righteousness, how we get the righteousness of God from Romans 3, 21 to 31. So from my point of view, it is very uh, straightforward. But I admit this, this area of discussion gets really muddy because people bring to it preconceived ideas mm-hmm. that, that they think they see in Scripture, they're reading into it. And you sort of have to reprogram yourself a little bit. And you say, because uh, I was the same way, you're used to saying things in certain ways. Mm-hmm. And, but you, once you look at the passage, it's not what they say. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I used to play golf with an elder from a, uh, another church, good guy and all, but when I brought this up to him, when this first became an issue with you, and we were talking about it and all, and I was on a golf course with him, and he gave, and I won't try to repeat it, but that classic, logical, you know, almost uh, soliloquy they give you, but it sounds so logical. You go, yeah, that makes sense, but it isn't biblical. Yeah. It makes no sense, but what you were saying a moment ago is so true. The definition of righteousness, they, meaning the covenant theology guys and, and many of the progressive covenantalist guys, they define righteousness as law keeping. That's not how the Bible describes righteousness. No, no. That's the whole issue. Because what you just read in, 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 in Romans, it, it clearly says it's not works of the law. It's not that. It is forgiveness. It is being made right. And that's done by the forgiveness of sin, not by anything I can do, by no work. Mm-hmm. So that that's where I just... You, once you And it's kind of like so many things. I always use the magic art analogy, but once you see it, you can't unsee it. And you and I have, have sort of drank the Kool-Aid. We see how Scripture clearly explains how and what righteousness is and what must take place for us to obtain it. And in no way does it talk about Christ's law-keeping. Yeah, then the, the closing two passages that we that are simply that confirm what we've been talking about in the classic summary of the work of Christ on the cross, Hebrews 10.14, where it says, by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The being made perfect forever corresponds to forgiveness of sins. So what we're saying, what God says is that if you get your sins forgiven by Christ on the cross, then you are given a status with God as though you have obeyed perfectly. But in reality, you've just had your sins forgiven. And then the second one is in Romans chapter 8 verses 3 and 4 where it talks in terms of as a result of the cross he condemned sin in the flesh, well that's what he did on the cross in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit this is the same thing as Hebrews 10 14 because he's saying that Christ's death on the cross fulfills the righteous requirement of the law. Well, what is the righteous requirement of the law? You have to obey perfectly, which means if you obey perfectly, you get a clean slate, a clean record. Well, if you get your sins forgiven, you get a clean record. Mm-hmm. And now we, we, we see in this context, they're only talking about the cross. Mm-hmm. So the cross of Jesus pays for all of our sins and it fulfills the righteous requirements of the law because it gives us a status with God as though we are perfect, right. when in reality we had our sins forgiven. So I have now become, I guess I'm just becoming a bit more aggressively mm-hmm. aggressive on this, that this is important. This is important. Uh, covenant theology is trying to make the case that th- that the law-keeping in Jesus, of Jesus in- imputed to us is an absolutely necessary ingredient for justification, and if we don't grasp that, we don't understand justification. And I'm saying, guys, Mm -hmm. you have fallen into the trap of being theologically driven, not Bible driven. And so for that reason alone, this is an important subject to talk about. So I no longer shy away from it. um, And we accept what may happen. Mm, Exactly. Another area where we would have disagreement with the progressive covenantal guys is they still find an they call it an instructive place for the Mosaic Law in the church's life. So they want to go back to the Mosaic Law, so about Ten Commandments, Moral Law, whatever they're calling it, and, and bring it forward into the church age, into the New Covenant era. Yeah, that one, um, 
it makes the concept of law rather fuzzy. And so just in order to answer that, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 19 to 21, where the Apostle Paul is giving his strategy on sharing his faith with Jews and Gentiles. Mm -hmm. In verse 20, he says this, To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. Then he repeats it, To those under the law, which is Jews. He's talking about Mosaic law. I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. So he's clearly saying, Guys, I am not under the Mosaic law. That with the coming of the end of the Old Covenant era, the version of God's law that is attached to that era, that covenant, the Mosaic Law is is no longer authoritative. I think it's as black and white and as simple to that. And of course, Paul goes on to say, to those not having the law, that is the Mosaic Law, I become like not like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. Mm-hmm. I'm not free from law because sin is breaking the law, 1 John 3, 4, but I'm under the law of Christ, a different version of God's law. Okay? than the Mosaic Law. So we would say that unless the Law of Christ brings over the Mosaic Law into the New Covenant era, it, that it is no longer binding. But once it brings it over, it's, it's authoritative, not because it was Mosaic Law, but because it's now part of the Law of Christ. And I think that black and white distinction about what, how do we know what law applies to us is crucial. I think that uh, what you're referring to there, at least as I read the guys who who uh, believe in this, from my perspective, the handling of law becomes really muddy. Mm. Not clear at all. Sometimes you talk in terms of the principle in the old. I like the Sabbath. We don't believe in a Sabbath day for today, but we believe in the one in seven principle. Yeah. No, we don't. There isn't principle is a myth. It's either law or not law. You know, and if it's not law, then you're not binding. There's no principle mm-hmm. that you have to follow. It's just no law. It's, it's it's black and white. So it's either law or not law for us today. The concept. So the idea that in some sense we are bound to follow in the church teachings from the Mosaic law. The answer is no. Not unless. The law of Christ is restated. This side of you know this state, it's restated in the law of Christ. Then of course it is authoritative, mm-hmm. but because it's part of the law of Christ. Right. So this is a, it's a big deal because mm-hmm. at least to me, the area in the evangelical church that is most muddy theologically is the area of law. Yeah, I mean without without a doubt. So and the last distinction that we'll talk about today is this one of uh, that the old covenant was a gracious covenant. That's what they would hold to. Yeah. um, I'm a tough person to talk to on that. (laughs) Because I think this is a absolute basic foundational truth of new covenant theology. Sure. Sure. That the old covenant is a works covenant. And, you know, you, let's turn, as it were, to Galatians chapter 4, the allegory of Hagar and Sarah. Mm-hmm. And let's just quickly walk through this, because I think this is the sort of the climactic explanation in the book of Galatians why it makes no sense to bring the Mosaic Law over this side of Pentecost because it belongs to the old covenant pre-Pentecost in the time of the picture and it's a works covenant so he says tell me you who want to be under the law that is the Mosaic law are you not aware of what the law says for it is written that Abraham had two sons one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman his son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh of course this is Hagar but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise of course, that was, uh, you know, uh, Ishmael to Hagar, mm. Isaac to Sarah. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. Now, you have to explain that 
Old Covenant produces unbelievers. And the only way it can produce unbelievers is if it's a works covenant. Forget everything else for the moment. That's the only way. If it's a gracious covenant, it will produce believers. If it is a gracious covenant, but it's not. And then, it, and then it says, this is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. Sarah represents, you know, the heavenly Jerusalem, which is the new covenant, which is a gracious covenant that produces believers. It's really as simple as that. But uh, probably if you're getting into the nitty-gritty, I would say you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where they describe the old covenant in these in uh, these rather graphic terms. Look at verse seven. Now, previously, they, they they talk in terms that the old covenant is to be described is summarized by the Ten Commandments, tablets on stone. And, of course, as soon as you hear that, that phraseology, you're thinking of the Ten Commandments. Mm-hmm. Well, we would say the Ten Commandments are a summary of the requirements of the Old Covenant. You've got to obey these things perfectly. But look at verse 7. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory. Well, that's the Old Covenant. But it's a ministry that brought death. And, and if you go down a little, far, little farther... Uh, in verse 9, if the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? It's comparing and contrasting Old Covenant the results of the Old Covenant with that of the New. The Old Covenant only can bring death because it's a works covenant. The New Covenant brings righteousness because it's the death of Christ on the cross. And once again, I think our friends who are stuck in this halfway house of progressive covenantalism, they're, they still have unable to shed the idea that the old covenant is another administration of the one covenant of grace, which is the classic phraseology of covenant theology. So to at least to some degree, they still buy that. Mm-hmm. And But my point is, you get to Second Corinthians 3, and you see that the old covenant is fundamentally different from the new. It can only, you know, Galatians 4, it can only produce unbelievers. It is a ministry of condemnation, ministry of death. There is no explanation that it is a ministry of grace. Mm. It's only negative. Only negative. Um, So once again, we would say, no, the old covenant is a works covenant that was never intended to be given as a means of salvation. It was a 1,500-year historical illustration of the futility of trying to be saved on the basis of what you do. Right. That's what it was. Yeah. Well, I hope this has been instructive uh, for those of you who have heard of progressive covenantalism, maybe even uh, taken a look at it, etc., to sort of really understand. They would call themselves, the progressive covenantalists, a subset of, of New Covenant theology, but we, we have some serious areas of disagreement. But they are brothers in, in the Lord, and we, you know, we, we, we work with some of them, and we, we fellowship with them. But just something to keep in mind, you know, whatever, uh, you know, what, what, in whatever area you may agree or disagree. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah and we really, you know, they are heading in a good direction. Definitely. And we are thrilled with the direction they're going. We just don't think they've arrived yet. No, they're still, they're still got a ways to go. But anyway, as always, thank you for uh, watching. Uh, if you'd like more information about this particular program or you have questions or suggestions for other programs, you can always go to our website, ids.org. Or, if more fun, you can call Jeff. My cell phone number is 480-313-8558. Uh, my email address is volker.jeff at gmail.com. I can be reached on a variety of apps. <laughs> what is you know? Visor, you know, there's just all brought WhatsApp. There is a whole bunch of them out there that I duo that we use to talk to people all around the world. But they're glad to talk to you. Until next time, thanks for watching.